Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for joining me uh, once again. Uh, we, of course, these sea days are pretty busy, and uh, I, I, I think the goal of a cruise is to be able to eat, sleep, and listen at the same time. And so that's what a pleasure of our, our, our voyage together. And today I'm going to talk about the age of exploration, which is essentially from a European perspective, but uh, but more broadly, uh, the 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 will to go and travel and the curiosity of humans has led us to where our global civilization is today and where we are today. And so that in, in every traveler, there is a bit of an explorer because you're willing to go out of your way, leave the comforts of home and expend yourselves to go out and be surprised and find something new. And even on this trip where many of us are going or to places where we've never been or have been previously, and what I do appreciate about being up here with you is that I get to hear from you and people who have had more experience in places and many other experiences that I've never had, and so I learn as much as I hope to share with you about what, what I've done in my own uh, exploring. Of course, as a sailor, travel is, uh, let's say, part of uh, the requirement, and uh, I used to go, uh, working off of ships, I carried a clepper folding sea kayak with sails, and so I would go off from ships and go off to places that I would never be able to go uh, before. Uh, and so uh, I, I left it at home this time, but I did a lot of uh, uh, beach combing in my younger age, and now I prefer to see it from a, a beautiful ship like this, though you never know when you get marooned. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to show you a, a bit about the, uh, what I'd say, the, the global heritage of exploration, which uh, essentially has broadened our perspective on the whole world and who we are as uh, humans on our now small planet. But back in antiquity, at least in Europe, this was the view of the world, which was, uh, let's say, a few land masses surrounding the Mediterranean, which is, the, of course, the heart of Western civilization. And then uh, uh, in Latin, it was called the ocean fluvius, the flowing oceans that were around the rest of it and the great unknown beyond what was known in ancient times just there in the Mediterranean. And uh, in medieval times, there was this concept that the world was round. It may have been flat to some people, but it was always surrounded by the seas, uncharted and unknown. And uh, if you look into the, the sort of the philosophical development of uh, what we considered for particularly geography, the world was considered to be three continents, Asia, uh, Europe, and the um, Africa, and then the climatic zones were known here as the, the polar, the moderate, the tropical. And there was always a presumption that there was more out there that had not been found yet, especially in the, let's say, the balancing of the world and the creation of it. There was probably going to be other lands that would balance out what was known. In this case, what they call terra australis, which was some unknown southern areas that were here de depicted as a tropical paradise. Now, this was where the name Australia came from, but of course it was not quite the way that they imagined it. And this uh, medieval chart shows, well, by the Portuguese actually, it's later, but that's the Cape uh, Hope in Africa, and then the Terra Austral Australis would be what we would think is Antarctica. It did not turn out to be a tropical paradise. But of course back then the, the world was full of uh, uh, ignorance and also fear of other places because when you would go it would often be a one-way trip and so those who came back often came back with uh, um, great tales of uh, savagery or imaginary creatures. Here's the original depiction of the Amazons who were the, the kingdom of women who happened to string up guys for, uh, for fun. But when the actual traveling happened it, it was based upon of course land treks and then the development of Ships and navigation was the essential way that humanity expanded its knowledge. So here's the ancient Egyptians who built very large ocean-going vessels to, to go down the Red Sea and down to the coast where we are uh, and explored their part of the world as, as they could, followed by the Greeks who came also all the way down here. The Persians came down to the Swahili coast here. And so in ancient times there were explorers, certainly, and uh, crossing the Indian Ocean uh, far before when the Europeans had the capability. Uh, now you may know th of the uh, research of Thor Heyerdahl who himself was a, uh, an explorer and a writer and he, his supposition was that it pr in prior 
history before it was written down, there had been migrations of ancient peoples across the oceans to, let's say, uh, transfer culture to the Americas, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In this case, he had recreated one of the uh, straw boats that were built in Mesopotamia in prehistory that were probably the first vessels to leave and go off and find the very ocean where we are today. The greatest of the explorers, though, was by far the Polynesians who left from the islands of the Western Pacific and then spread all through the Pacific Island. This is a Santa Cruz uh, vessel which has a fantastic uh, claw sail. But the, the, the feat of the Polynesians to cross half of the planet and find islands was uh, remarkable, often led by um, star charts and their knowledge of celestial navigation and the waves and the uh, currents and such so they could, they could find land even though you would go out there and you'd think they'd ever find any. Oh, b oh, by the way, I should say, I always wear a Maui hook, if any of you know this, which is the sailor's talisman, which is for the god, the Polynesian god Maui. And the, and the idea of it is, is if you can't find land, you take it off, you drop it deep in the ocean, and you pull up a new island. If you need one, let me know. Um, but then let's come back to, let's say, where we are, the Indian Ocean, Africa, the Middle East. And this is, again, that... Um, uh, Il Idrisi map from Baghdad in the 11th century, which was one of the earliest charts that showed this area, however geographically not correct, but it showed that people had gone down the coast where we are today and established trade settlements and probably went all the way around Africa far before the European discovery of it. And the Arabs had a compulsion to travel, which was led by one of the five pillars of Islam, which is to make the Hajj and go to Mecca. So from, you know, 1,500 years ago till now, all Muslims must travel to Mecca, and thereby that led to, let's say, the first uh, organized tourist industry, which was to go to uh, the Hajj. And so here's an illustration from the medieval Arabic period of, of a group who are traveling from afar. Of course, now they fly in uh, on jets to go to the Hajj, but it used to be a great and arduous journey. This uh, traveler Ibn uh, uh, Batatu was a Berber from Morocco, and at age 16 he was a young scholar and a devout Muslim, and he made his first Hajj as a teenager. And he wrote, I, it pains me to, to leave my parents and my family and to go, but I feel I should go now while I'm young and I can understand before I get too aged to make the great trip from Morocco all the way to what's now Saudi Arabia. And then when he got there, uh, he had already had a number of languages and a very obviously a very uh, brilliant young fellow, he kept going and he went on to travel down the coast where we are now, then to India, and then he ended up in the Maldives as a uh, Islamic judge for the rulers in Malay where we, where we just were. Then he continued on to Sri Lanka all the way to China. Then he went up to the Great Wall, uh, visited the, uh, the Khan in, Mongo uh, in, the, in Beijing at the time, came all the way back uh, to Cairo, then he went down into Central Africa, Mali, and then he finally ended up back in Morocco as an official. And he, he's been called the, the Islamic uh, Marco Polo, and his, his uh, memoir is called the Ra'il, which is the voyage, describes in great detail all these places that he traveled to. Now, he, he was on many boats on the way. He was not a navigator per se, but his writings are still classic uh, uh, Arabic literature. And then, of course, there were the sailors who would travel far and wide, particularly the Arabs, all through the Indian Ocean to China, where they established their trading posts in the 8th century AD. And there's still a mosque in Guangzhou that is founded by the Arabic traders from back in that era. And I already talked about Ahmed bin uh, Majid, who's called the Lion of the Seas, who was the, the, the pilot and navigator who de detailed the sailing instructions to go to many of the places where we are going now. And he had been in Mombasa uh, just before us. And then he became later the uh, pilot for Vasco da Gama. Well, this you know, period of time is sort of legendary, including the, the uh, one, uh, Thousand and One Nights tales of Sinbad the Sailor. And uh, th that becomes where exploration becomes, let's say, fantasy. And uh, they get picked up by giant birds and meat monsters and all those great tales of that particular classic as portrayed by, is that Errol Flynn or is that, or is that the new captain on board? I can't tell. <laughs> Anyway, um, of course, Marco Polo was the great land uh, traveler for the European 
tradition, and he had gone all the way across the Camel routes and ended up in China, came all the way back by sea via the Indian Ocean. And his tales, again, uh, flabbergasted people when they were finally translated. And uh, someone uh, told me recently that the, the word uh, million that we have in European languages was directly from the name of Marco Emilio Polo. And people called his story so fantastic that he was an emiliare. He was exaggerating things. And at the time, Roman letters were how they um, would write out numbers. But there's only a few large numerals for a thousand, and then there were none for any larger numbers. So they, uh, uh, Emilio became million, meaning a vast exaggeration. So now when we talk about the defense budget, we go into millions and billions and trillions. That's because of Marco Polo's middle name. Anyway, believe it or else. But in Europe at the time, uh, it had a very narrow view of the world. A few travelers went out, and the, here, here's one of the, what they call a philosophes map, which just tries to define the world according to the theology or the philosophy rather than the geography. So Asia, Africa, and Europe were extensions of civilization and knowledge with Jerusalem at the center. And then there's the rest of it out around here. Now this was after um, a time America had been found by then. Uh, but here's a, to a Ptolemaic map uh, after the Greek philosopher who lived in Egypt. This is about 1420, an illustration of the known world at the time, which extended off to Asia and somewhat down into Africa, but anything to the far north, far west, or far south was unknown. And then the Europeans started to travel. Now, uh, to generalize about Europeans is like generalizing about Asians. They were all various, doing various things and highly competitive. So the, the Norse traveled off into the North Sea and traveled across very rough and um, uh, foggy and difficult seas. I don't have one with me, but they had a special crystal stone where you could see by polarization of light in a cloud the actual direction of the sun. And so they had a secret navigation technique, which I hope they have on this ship also. But of course, the sea was great dangerous and of course we are hoping not to meet one of these while we're out here. If we do though, that's when you have to call for help. And how many sailors got lost because they didn't know what to say to the mermaids? Well, nonetheless the, uh, the Norse and in this case the, old, the ancient Irish crossed the Atlantic Ocean. This is Tim Severin's recreation of the, of the voyage, of, a voyage of Brendan who crossed over and famously ended up in his kayak on top of a whale, went on to discover and then come back and tell about it. But then the Norwegians, uh, the Norse in general, crossed over to Green Iceland, Greenland, and then Leif Erikson uh, crossed over to uh, what is now Newfoundland and established the remains of the settlements which were eventually lost. Now, mean, meanwhile, back in, in the Mediterranean, Venice was the great commercial capital for trade between Asia and the rest of Europe. And then when Constantinople was taken by the Turks, the gateway to the east was impoverished, let's say. They had to pay either far more or they could not get what they wanted, particularly from the, from the far east, the Chinese silks, the spices, and things that were so precious in Europe. So here's a, a Dutch master's painting of a, of a geographer trying to figure out how do they get around the Islamic control of the Middle East. And so this was uh, a major question for that era in the 13th, 14th, 15th century that somehow there had to be a way by sea. And the great invention that made it possible is the magnetic compass. Uh, this is one from my own collection for a Chinese compass, which uh, is actually used for fortune telling. They considered it a sort of a magical art that was later put to navigation by putting it in a box and taking it out to sea. Here's an illustration from Italy in Amalfi, which shows on the left-hand side there the, the compass that's on the vessel so that ships could safely go offshore in into weather and then have a general idea where they're going. Every compass now has what's called the rose, which is based upon the directions of the magnetic north, south, east, west, but it also would be related to the traditional winds in the Mediterranean. And the cardinal points comes into uh, eight points on a compass and this became the basis of navigation for up till now with our modern techniques, particularly when it was put into a gimbal so it was more reliable on a rolling sea and could be 
rel relatively a steady needle and compass, otherwise it would be completely inaccurate. This one is uh, said to be Columbus's own compass that was uh, taken on his voyages to the Americas and came back. It's in the Casa Colon in, in Gran Canaria Islands. But notice uh, in the middle there's the uh, Mary and the Virgin Jesus. The problem with compasses is that, that the, the Earth's magnetic pole is not the same as the actual axis of the planet. And so as you go further to the poles, the, the variations in a magnetic compass get to be extreme. You can see where we are, it's maybe 10 degrees off to the west, the, the variation of the compass. And uh, when you study navigation, you have to know where the variations are to correct the compass bearing such as it could be. When you get up to, let's say, the, the current magnetic north pole of the planet is, of course, in Canada. Thank you very much. And uh, down in the southern hemisphere, it's way down in Antarctica. And so there's a struggle for centuries to try to, let's say, correlate the actual geographic destinations with the magnetic uh, reading. So this is a, what's called an armillary in the uh, National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, which tries to uh, coordinate the magnetic compass that's at the base to the sightings of different stars for uh, correction of uh, sailing instructions and determination of uh, magnetic direction. This is a pocket compass that was made in England in the late 1600s, which has, again, a, a sighting instrument, uh, different markings for magnetic variation. And so this was the navigator's uh, great instrument at that time, like a pocket watch. Um, but the Arabs had developed a astrolabe, which is again a sighting instrument to sight the sun or, or a planet or a star, and then to make calculations from that sighting to then determine direction, latitude, if not longitude. This is a document to explain the use of it that was published in Baghdad in the 12th century, again uh, using uh, Arist Aristotelian mathematics and an advanced mathematics that had not been translated into Latin and got to Europe till a later century. And then when it was known that you could determine this, uh, the, there was a development of the different staffs, the broad staff, the long staff, fitted with optical viewing, and that eventually became the sextant. And that's the standard for sightings on a ship. We have one aboard uh, right now. I hope they can find it if they need it, but this has all become a uh, practice that is, let's say, secondary to the actual operation of a of ships now with GPS and electronics. The other problem was the determination of longitude. And it used to be you'd keep a sand glass like this, which in calm seas is fine. In tropical seas, the sand would tend to clump up, so it became very, very inaccurate. And the, 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 the duty of a, of a watch uh, on a ship to this day, it's called that, is to watch the sand uh, the hourglass and see when it's done, turn it over, make a notation. But it could be very, very inaccurate again. But to this day, we still call, uh, the ship has four watches, which means you're watching the instruments. It used to be just watch the hourglass. Longitude finally became a problem that was solved by the development of the chronometer by John Harrison, the clockmaker, who, uh, this is a story you can read, there's some books about it, but he, he was a tinker and he developed the first clock that could be accurate in spite of it rolling around in an unstable sea or being in a different temperature. So it has a pendulum and a spring and such. Replace the standard, let's say, standing clock that works on land. And he developed this into what was H3, which was finally tested by the Royal Navy, taken by Captain James Cook himself out to test. And this became what we have as our pocket watch. So this is a direct descendant of that effort to try to determine longitude out at sea. Now you can sight the stars and know your latitude relatively well, but the idea behind a chronometer is you have a standard of time and then as you measure the sighting of apparent noon, which means the actual height of the sun wherever you are in the world, then you compare it to your clock and you know how far east and west you are. And that was the major development that improved navigation to the point where we are today. Now that happened actually later than the European explorers set out. Uh, this is the uh, Infante Principe, Henry the Navigator, the second son of King Zhao II, whose mother was English, by the way. And he set up the school of navigation uh, that became the leading academy to train Portuguese navigators to go out around the world. You've probably seen in Lisbon his statue right there on the 
Tagus River with all the adventurers that followed him out. He did not himself go, but he had an academy at Sagres down on the southwest tip of Portugal where he trained people. And, and you see the big compass rose. It's near the buildings. That was for sighting and training of navigators. The other development that led to the age of exploration for Europe was the improvement in shipbuilding technology, particularly the Caravel, which was a, a planked and a ribbed ship that became able to be larger than merely a barge or small vessels. And so in Lisbon and across Europe at the time, they developed better shipbuilding techniques that um, also replaced the downwind sail. So the square riggers, which were the standard sail rig for Europe at the time, were developed into the what's called the Latin rig, which is the triangular sail that's common on all yachts these days. And the advantage of that rig is that it can go further upwind. So if you're facing a wind, you can go 15 degrees either way of it and continue your course without having to bear off and only follow the wind. And so that was the reason how ships like the Santa Maria and others could go out and then they could make a course fairly well uh, to unknown places. Now this is one of those many reproductions of the Santa Maria and of course you know all this from your uh, <coughs> elementary education but at the time in the 1400s the largest of the ships of Europe were far dwarfed by the Chinese fleets and this is and behind the Santa Maria is for scale the illustration of the nine masted flagship of the Chinese Admiral Zheng He who had uh, hundreds of these vessels following and trading through Southeast Asia up to Japan and then exploring into the Indian Ocean. And in this somewhat romantic, uh, dr uh, dramatic illustration of Zheng He and his Mandarin cloak, he was the uh, admiral of these exploration f fleets that left in the early 1400s, 1412 to about 1455. They had seven major expeditions that traveled across the Indian Ocean to Africa and up into the Red Sea and Persian Gulf. And uh, this is a subject, I have a whole other presentation on, on this particular era of, vo of voyaging, if you're interested, but um, you know, it's been said that, uh, particularly by the writer Gavin Menzies, that had the Chinese continued in this exploration effort, they might have gone around and colonized Europe rather than it be the other way around, finally. But there was turmoil in China. The fleets were called back. They were considered a, a great expense that they didn't need to do. Uh, and so the age of Chinese exploration ended, though there's still some historical controversy how far they got and where they settled, whether they left remnant populations, even in the Americas. This particular map, which is at the Yale University Bodiglia Library, is, is a 1740 copy of a map that in its inscription says it was from the period of Chinese exploration in 1418 in their calculation. Whether or not the Chinese knew about the Americas and the Arctic and the Antarctic is a, is a subject of great speculation. And perhaps it was an impetus for the Europeans to go out. There were among navigators, there was all this knowledge that was being rumored or shown from the East to say, well, if you keep going, you will find things out here. So here's a sort of fanciful illustration of the, one of the uh, early navigators going out there when the sea was full of gods and monsters and angels and such. And then if they got, went out there, they had phenomena that they did not have in, in the home waters of Europe. This is St. Elmo, who was the patron saint of sailors. And to this day, there's called St. Elmo's fire in the rigging of a tall ship where static electricity uh, builds up and then the, uh, the rigging will actually spark with lights. And that's meant to be a, a signal from God that you will be safe on your trip. Well, you can imagine the, the various... Uh, sailors who went out not knowing where they were going. This is a rather uh, not well-known Portuguese uh, navigator who left uh, early in the early 1400s, Gilles Inés, and he went down and crossed the, uh, the, the bend of West Africa, which there's a cape called Cape Bojador, which is famously dangerous because the sea will drive your ship onto the rocks and many got lost there. But he was one of the first that decided to go out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean just to get around that and do what they call La Volta, which became the standard sailing instructions on how to get around, you see, uh, Bajador, it's just south of the Canary Islands. And then they would get around, they knew they could get down to the Gulf of Guinea. 
and then continue on. So this was the, the great contribution of the Portuguese, was to continue the sailing at great um, loss of life into the doldrums and in tropical coasts, and the, but they, they managed to come all the way down to what's now Angola, and then finally down to Cape of Good Hope in 1482. Now we're going there in Cape Town now, um, but uh, this is such a dramatic, beautiful place, we'll, we'll get to see it ourselves. But at that point it was a very far away, of course, and it was called the state, uh, Cape of Storms in Portuguese, and it was renamed by the king of the Cape of Good Hope because they, they hoped to continue and go on to the greater world in the east. But of course the Spanish were uh, the, the competitors of the Portuguese and they hired uh, at Christopher Columbus's insistence that there was a way to the Indies going west uh, and he became of course the greatest of the explorers and navigators. And the, the politics of the time was that uh, Ferdinand and Isabella had united the Spanish nation. She had taken the, the uh, crown of Castilla and Leon by killing her own brother by the way. And then they together uh, sponsored Columbus. He convinced them that he had knowledge from his travels in the eastern Mediterranean that there was a way to the Indies to the sailing west across the Atlantic Ocean. And this is one of the charts of the time. Uh, and you can see, for instance, uh, the, there's an isle called Brazil. Now Brazil is actually the name of a dye. It was uh, make indigo. The name f was transferred to the great nation now. And then Madeira, now that's um, Cadiz, oops, sorry, down here into Gibraltar. Uh, but this island here, uh, Isla de Antilla, which was where the name the Antilles came from, um, some people said that the drawing of that particular island looks very much like the Puerto Rico. But who was there prior to Columbus to draw that chart? And it may have been Portuguese fishermen who were famous for going out finding fish but not telling people where they found them. And so it, it's a bit of a speculation of who was there before Columbus. But the, the, the other problem was is that the, the world's expanse was not very well known. So Columbus proposed that the Antilla right there, the Azor that were known, and then beyond that is Sipango. That's the old name for Japan in Portuguese. And then what they call Cathay, India, and all the Spice Islands, Java, et cetera. But the distance was not really known. So he thought it would only take a matter of maybe two to three weeks of sailing and he would find his way in the Indies. So he always thought that that's where he was, even though after he set up his expedition in Sevilla and was sent off, uh, he, he never thought he'd be, be discovering a new world, meaning the, the Americas. Well, these are, again, uh, romantic uh, illustrations of Ferdinand and Isabella sending Columbus off with the blessing of the church, of course, to missionize, and then he, he had made a compact that he would be the governor and his family would own any of the islands that he would discover in the name of the crown. Well, this is one of those reproduction voyages of the, uh, the Santa Maria and the Pinta de Nina across. And so they were out there in the tropical seas. It took them um, more than a few weeks. It took them over a month, at which point the sailors were running out of food and they were um, threatening mutiny to turn back. And Columbus famously pounded a gold coin on the mast said, anybody who sights land will get this coin as their reward, so keep a lookout. Well, they did find land 33 days later after they sent out of Cadiz, and here on this illustration in the logbook, Ayaya Tierra, which means here's land, and it was his own um, servant that found the, or that sighted land, and uh, did, but Columbus did not give him the coin because he was just a servant, but uh, it's, been, it's been wondered where did he actually land? So. Many of these islands from, oh, up in the Bahamas down to the Turk and Caicos, they all claim that he landed there, and this is subject of some archaeology. Currently, it's considered Watling's Island. And he kept a very careful log, so they're comparing the, his entry, what he saw, to what happened. But above all, he ran into uh, indigenous people, which he dubbed the Indians, thinking he was off the shores of some place in the Asia. And again, illustrations of how friendly they were as he put the royal uh, saber and the cross up and claimed them in the name of, of the royal crown.